good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Dorsey's webinar entitled Laws for the Birds and the Bats, Impact of Wildlife Protection Laws on Energy Project Development. Uh, my name is, is Thad Lightfoot and with me is Jim Rubin. We are both partners and environmental lawyers in Dorsey's Regulatory Affairs Group. I'm based in Minneapolis. Uh, Jim is based in Washington, D.C. We've each been practicing environmental law for nearly 30 years and both served with the Justice Department's Environmental and Natural Resources Division. And specific to our discussions today, both of us have extensive experience in conducting due diligence on wildlife protection laws in the context of energy development projects. And in addition, Jim has experience in defending enforcement actions under a number of the federal wildlife protection laws that we're going to, to, to discuss this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions during the program, please email them to dorseyu.com and we will answer them uh, as we are able. Uh, if you have questions uh, offline after the program is over, we'll have contact information for you on the last slide. Uh, you could uh, email Jim or myself and we'll respond, or you could also send those questions uh, to dorseyu.com. One quick housekeeping item before we get started. Uh, yesterday, everyone received a sign-in sheet with a reminder about this program. If you're looking for CLE credit for the program, please fill that sign-in sheet, sign sheet out and return it uh, to Michelle Hubble uh, at Dorsey and & Whitney. Uh, and with that, uh, let's begin our program. Uh, we're going to focus on wildlife, uh, federal wildlife laws that are implicated in energy development projects, uh, including the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which we'll refer to as the Bird Act, uh, and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which we'll refer to uh, as the Eagle Act. Uh, we'll also briefly discuss other related federal laws, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, as well as uh, state statutory analogs, including state environmental review statutes, state wetland laws, and state endangered species laws. We'll then discuss two hypotheticals that apply these laws, uh, one to a wind power project and one to a combined cycle natural gas plant. We'll then briefly touch on the special considerations uh, for transmissions and pipeline projects. And finally, we'll discuss some practical strategies and recommendations uh, that, uh, regarding the application of these statutes uh, to energy development projects. Uh, with that, Jim is going to begin by giving us an overview of the Endangered Species Act. So Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Thad, uh, and thank everybody for joining us. I, I drew the short feather on this uh, presentation, so I'm handling the ESA. My aim is to give you a very general overview. Um, there's a lot of details to ESA, particularly involving some of the processes we'll discuss. My aim is not to go into the great detail. The slides are very detailed, but I'm, I'm going to give you a, a more of an overview uh, to familiarize yourself with the terms and processes and decision points. Um, but if you get into one of these decision points in an actual project, obviously you'll have to dig into the details a bit more. So speaking very generally, the purpose of the Endangered Species Act, as everyone knows, is to protect and conserve species. Uh, and to do that, the, uh, the, the Act contains a number of protections, uh, including listing species as endangered or threatened. Uh, and um, protections also go to critical habitat of the species. And there are regulations, which we'll discuss in a little bit later, called 4D regulations, where, uh, yeah, where you can actually, uh, Fish and Wildlife or, or NIMS can put regulations that are protective of threatened species as well. And there is the, the prohibition of take. And that's where I want to focus on because that's the one most relevant to these energy projects. Take uh, is very broadly uh, defined in the Endangered Species Act. It means more than just killing. It means harming. There's a whole series of words you see there, hunting, shooting. Um, but the important thing is it's, um, it's, uh, it's also not only interpreted broadly in terms of the action you're taking on the, on the species, it also includes significant habitat modification and degradation or actually you know, death or injury to the wildlife. Um, I put a little star there because uh, I wanted to tell you how broad it would be. Essentially, you can, you can harm or injure wildlife through, uh, it, or, uh, through its uh, modification of habitat by impairing essential behavior patterns, including breeding, spawning, rearing, migrating, feeding, and sheltering. Point is, it's pretty broad. There are a lot of uh, actions that are encompassed by the concept of take. Uh, take only uh, applies to endangered species under the Act. However, under the 4D rule I mentioned before, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, or NIMS, the uh, NOAA uh, organization, uh, if it's their species, uh, can, can uh, put a regulation out that applies take to that particular threatened species. In many cases, we'll discuss having to do with the bats, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has just done that. Um, aside for take, 
uh, you actually, the, uh, the uh, Endangered Species Act does allow for something called incidental take, which is defined to be take incidental to otherwise lawful activities. And there are two processes for doing that, um, Section 7 and Section 10. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. Just to back up a little bit, I, I kind of went over, the, went over this quickly, but uh, there are two agencies involved in the uh, implementation of the Endangered Species Act. The one you're most likely to deal with on terrestrial projects is the Fish and Wildlife Service, which handles all terrestrial wildlife, plants, and freshwater fish. NIMFS, the National Marine Fisheries Service, otherwise known as NOAA Fisheries, handles marine species and anadromous fish uh, like salmon. Uh, so if moving on to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about the two ways to go about getting a permit for incidental take. In other words, harm that will befall an endangered species or a threatened species by an energy development project, which is otherwise lawfully done. Uh, the first way of doing it is called uh, federal agency consultations. It's the famous Section 7, and this is only triggered by a federal nexus. So you can't do a consultation unless there's some federal hook. The hook could be a permit, and there are lots of permits that bring this in, like uh, wetlands permits or FERC licenses, or leasing uh, activities in federal land. So a lot of projects end up in Section 7 because of a federal permit or because you're using federal land. Uh, but not every project, as we'll discuss, has a federal hook to it. Uh, when you get a project that has a federal hook to it, you have a distinction between action agencies and consulting agencies. Consulting agencies are the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and NIMFS. Um, the action agency is the agency that is either leasing the property or giving you the permit. And uh, the permit applicant is a key player in this process. The Section 7 is basically covering agency um, uh, consultations, but the permit applicant plays a very strong role, uh, including in, uh, involved in all aspects of the process, including providing data, um, in fact, as we'll talk about in the conclusions, it's actually imperative for the applicant to kind of get in this process early to help define the proposed action before the government does and to actually draft the documents like a biological assessment. Um, and to do so, it has to request status as either applicant or non-federal representative status. So it's very important for the applicant to be involved in this process, but the process is primarily for agencies to do it together. The standard the process looks for is to make sure uh, the action does not jeopardize, likely jeopardize the continued existence of a species or adversely modify its habitat. That's called the jeopardy standard, and you want to avoid the jeopardy standard no matter what you do. This is the um, uh, a jeopardy, jeopardy finding can stop your project or involve extremely onerous conditions on it. So it kind of, that's the end result. You want to work backwards from that and make sure your project doesn't get anywhere near a jeopardy standard. Um, so to get there, uh, you begin what are called initial consultations. So, so you want to take a federal action, you want a permit, you want, you want to do something on, uh, on, on BLM land, um, you work with the agency, uh, the primary action agency, and you um, start a process that usually involves writing a biological assessment. Uh, it's supposed to be by the agency, but as I said before, the applicant can do it. And uh, it makes two determinations. One is um, informal uh, uh, finding uh, that the species, there'll be no effect on the species by the project. Um, and if that's done, um, and, uh, and that's a conclusion of the initial consultations, um, the project could proceed without any kind of uh, concurrence from the agencies. However, if the determination is made at the initial consultation stage that there may be an effect on an on endangered species or a threatened species, uh, then you have to uh, take one of two roads. Uh, one road is a continued uh, informal consultation uh, where you have to basically show that any impact on the, on the uh, endangered species is discountable and significant or even beneficial. Um, you can't have a take of a, of a species there. And um, you basically uh, lay out for the agency uh, the uh, avoidance and minimization efforts you take to avoid any kind of take, and you seek a concurrence from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that that is indeed uh, not going to adversely affect the species. That is the informal process. Um, there is a more formal process. What happens if you make a determination, or the agency does, that your process is actually to likely adversely affect. So we switch slides now. Um, uh, I'm going to continue to finish the Section 7 concept. So what happens in formal consultations result essentially in nothing. You have no biological opinion. You have an assessment, not an opinion. We'll talk about it in a second. And you don't have an incidental take authorization because you're not taking anything. What you're creating is a record of fish and wildlife involvement and characterization of the action. And hopefully you've gotten a letter from Fish and Wildlife Service telling you that you uh, were correct. And, uh, and you weren't taking a species. The Fish and Wildlife Service may not write that letter, uh, but you certainly can ask for it in federal consultations. They, they are supposed to do that. Uh, they have no regulatory requirement to do that, but it's your practice in Section 7 to do a, a, a concurrence. Um, if, however, you end up in a, uh, 
in formal consultations, uh, what that means is you end up having to have a biological opinion written, which is, again, written by the agency, but probably by the applicant and its experts, looking at certain information, including baseline conditions, cumulative impacts, and then um, a determination about whether the, the project is going to have a jeopardy or adverse modification um, uh, on the species. If so, um, you have to come up with what are known as reasonable and prudent measures, or RPMs, which are then instituted by terms and conditions. Um, the most important part of this process is you get an incidental take statement. In other words, if you go through this process, it's possible you could actually cause harm to an endangered species and you'll be authorized to cause some specific type of harm to the species in, in terms of the quality and quantity as long as there's no jeopardy. Um, if there is jeopardy finding, however, um, you can't go forward without what are called reasonable and prudent alternatives. The RPAs are different RPMs because the RPMs in terms of conditions um, can't be major uh, steps to change the project, whereas a reasonable prudent alternative, if you have a jeopardy, actually changes the project. Uh, important note here, the National Environmental Policy Act, your impact statements are not required through consultations. The consultation is essentially an EIS uh, review, but you might need to do NEPA for a federal permit that's underlying this Section 7 consultations. So you're not out of the woods on the ESA. You're also not out of the woods because the agency can um, reinitiate uh, consultations if there's a take ex exceedance or some other problem. And the most important thing for project developers probably is this all provides a basis for a citizen suit challenging your action and trying to slow your project down. Uh, there are advantages for the Section 7. It's predictable and straightforward. It's been used for lots and lots of projects. It's very efficient. There are deadlines given in the statute itself. Um, it can be combined with other permits, uh, and, um, and it's, believe it or not, the least time-consuming method outside of the quick and formal no-take, um, no-effect uh, review we talked about. Uh, it could take anywhere from three to nine months or maybe longer um, in total. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is it does take time, it's costly, and it is a hook for a citizen suit. Uh, moving on to uh, the next uh, section 10, which is uh, the other way to get um, a permission for incidental take of an endangered species. This actually is a, a specific statutory exception to take. Um, this is a situation you, you find yourself in if you have no federal nexus at all. In other words, you have a project that's not going to get any federal permits. It's not going to be on federal land. For instance, it's a wind project in, um, in a, on the prairie in the Midwest, and it's not affecting any federal land. Um, you, ha can, you, uh, you can't go through the, the uh, consultation process in uh, Section 7. Your only choice is to take a Section 10 or not at all, um, and, but you have harm to the species. That's why you're in the Section 10 world. Uh, it is an exception to take, as I mentioned. And the problem with this pro program is you have to go through much more uh, a costly and dilatory process called the Habitat Conservation Plan. It's a, a, a very voluminous report where you have to study the impact of the species, um, various species from your project, come up with minimization and avoidance measures, but also mitigation measures, not just how to avoid harming the species, but what you would do to buy land or do other kinds of actions, affirmative actions that would protect the species. Um, you're supposed to do these to the maximum extent practicable, not move heaven and earth if it's not going to ever happen, but you have to show these practical, um, that the uh, taking won't appreciably reduce the likelihood of survival of the species. It's different than a Jeopardy standard. Uh, you have to show you can fund this. You have to consider alternatives. And uh, in exchange for all this, you get something called the no surprise assurance, which essentially is if you do a, uh, a permit and it's fully implemented, uh, the government won't require you to do additional measures if there are uh, problems um, to the species, unless, of course, there's a Jeopardy and then all, all uh, our steps are off. So there is some benefit to it. Uh, you also have to do some adaptive management for changed circumstances. Um, there, are, there are advantages, obviously, with this process because if you're without a federal hook, it's the only way to get an a, uh, exception, a, a permit to actually take a species. Uh, the problems with it are it's very uh, significant delay. You're probably subject to NEPA because the Section 10 uh, permit actually requires a NEPA analysis unless there's a categorical exclusion for low-impact studies, but most of the time you're doing a, some form of a, a NEPA assessment. Um, there's open public comment on the permit itself as well as on NEPA. <coughs> and you have a problem with agency resources because uh, you have to get all this done through the agency. Um, and uh, the one way of, uh, of trying to um, – and there's also no deadlines uh, like in the in Section 7, so you can be in this process for two to three years or even more. You also have to negotiate with a number of stakeholders – because your habitat conservation plan is probably going to look at a fairly broad piece of property that involves lots of different people. Um, the, what, one of the things that is going on right now um, 
in order to try to streamline this process a bit, and particularly in the wind area, is there, are there efforts to do these multi-species regional habitat conservation plans? There's one fairly well detailed in the works in the Midwest. I think Thad's going to talk a little bit about just on wind. And the Great Plains uh, are working on a, uh, another program as well. And there are other kind of programmatic projects, like the Western Power Association, which is putting together a regional plan for all the folks who are hooking up to its system. So there are efforts underway to try to make a regional, regional HCP for multiple species, so you can plug yourself into that and not spend the time and money. However, at the current time, a permit takes a long time and is very expensive. Uh, and the last piece of it is, of course, if you get a permit, your take is restricted to the amount permitted and subject to the conditions that you put in and you get your permit. So you have to meet your conditions, and if you only have take, for instance, of five species, and you, and you act, actually take six, you can be prosecuted for the six take. Um, that is, uh, in, in a nutshell, the, um, oh, on the, of course, there's a third route, which a lot of folks find themselves in these days when they don't want to go the permit route because they don't think they need to, um, but they can't go the Section 7 route, and that is basically to try to avoid and minimize impact without a permit. Um, that, of course, is a risky proposition because you can never guarantee um, you're not going to be prosecuted. But if you do a proper assessment of the species, you identify potential impacts, uh, you uh, basically uh, take action and minimization to reduce uh, harm to the species, and you take a lot of the steps that Thad's going to describe in a minute, um, you can do a lot to, uh, to minimize of chance the risk of take and also to minimize the risk of liability from take, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, Thad's going to speak on this without a permit um, matter at the end of this all because there are other aspects of, uh, of laws that are relevant to it. But essentially, um, you can do a project uh, without an endangered species permit if you can give yourself enough insurances you're not going to harm an endangered species. So let's go to the, uh, the next slide, which is the enforcement. Just, this is what happens if you violate the Endangered Species Act. There are very high penalties per, per taking, um, 50,000 civil um, for a knowing take. In other words, you have to do an action you knew you were doing. Does, you don't have to know it was an endangered species, but you have to know you're taking the action. And it's $1,000 for a non-knowing violation per, species, per, per um, take. But there are also criminal penalties for knowing takes as well. And these actually are quite substantial, $100,000 um, for a take, $200,000 if you're a corporation and you're in prison. You can forfeit all your equipment. Uh, and more importantly to folks uh, who are, you know, not just the criminal violations, but there's injunctive relief provided, the government can go and stop you for what you're doing. Um, added to that, there's also a citizen supervision, which only appears in this act and none of the others that we're going to talk about today, where citizens can seek injunctive relief, fees and costs uh, in your project, as well as actually can get you for, citizen, for, for civil penalties, but they don't get the money, it goes to the government. But it's, um, you can also have your, uh, your uh, license suspended and, uh, and so forth. But the, and the reason that I bring the citizens uh, up is because there was a case about six years ago called Animal Welfare, the Beach Ridge out of Maryland District Court, where the court actually pers prospectively enjoined the construction of an operational wind farm in West Virginia upon a finding that a project would, after a trial and lots of uh, effects, would in inherently harm the Indiana bat. Um, and that case essentially... Uh, it was brought against the, uh, the uh, project developer, and that project was held up for a number of years until an initial take permit was actually selected for the, uh, for the species. So this citizen suit has some real uh, teeth to it, and it's there um, in case you don't get a permit. This is what you might uh, face in terms of risk. Uh, so the last slide on endangered species, I just want to kind of throw out a couple, couple species there you should be able to look for. Um, not all the species here are listed as endangered which is pretty significant, but uh, for those involved uh, in wind projects in the Midwest, the whooping crane is a big worry because there's only about 350 left in the world, and um, they have a fairly large migration spe uh, uh, area. Thad will talk about that. The piping plover is also a, a threatened species found in a lot of riparian areas, so your wind projects and other um, energy projects that affect riparian areas can have an effect. The Indiana bat and the northern long-eared bat are both bat species that have got a lot of concern uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, because they are uh, susceptible to wind blades, are often in, in wind projects, particularly the northern long-eared bat has a rule that just came out, a 4D rule, where you are, have certain restrictions on land clearing activities, tree clearing activities, if you're in the region for where the white nose syndrome has appeared on the bat. And I have the, the sage grouse, which is actually not listed because Fish and Wildlife Service cut a deal, um, and instead of having a, uh, a, any kind of a 4D rule, there are these extensive land management resource plans. If you find yourself on the uh, plains and any sage grouse around, you have, chances are you're subject to a fairly um, 
uh, uh, detailed uh, planning resource management process. Same thing with desert tortoise, very uh, important issue if you're out in the desert. All these are kind of uh, what you call a charismatic megafaun in a sense. You can't forget the fact that a lot of times you've got insects, butterflies, beetles, uh, lots of plants, and of course fish and crustaceans that are involved in the endangered species as well, salmon being one of the common fish. So uh, there are lots of things to worry about, and one thing to do is to be aware of what the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing on a yearly basis. They came out with a plan uh, for listing through 2023, including the lesser prairie chicken, which is another big issue we heard, like the sage grouse. It's another uh, species across a broad swath of the, uh, of the Midwest and West, and the little brown bat, which is another wind project. So that's, that's for us to look, forward, look out for. I'm going to end at this point, and it's really sad to talk about the MBTA. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is give uh, an overview of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Bird Act, uh, and the uh, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, the Eagle Act, uh, which are of significant concern for wind projects um, in particular. Um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act makes it illegal for anyone to take, and essentially it means kill, but it's also possess or import or export or sell or purchase uh, either migratory birds uh, or parts or nests of those birds or eggs uh, of, of the birds. Uh, there is a long list of migratory bird species that are protected by the Act. Um, it's, it's over a thousand now. Uh, it's about uh, about a thousand fifty, uh, and that's um, uh, that's uh, part of uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's regulations. It's Fish and Wildlife uh, that has the statutory authority. Uh, to enforce the Bird Act. Uh, just a word on history. This is the oldest statute that we will discuss today. It ba dates back to the 19. It dates back to the early 20th century to 1918. It was initially passed in response to the rampant hunting of migratory birds for their feathers. They were apparently very popular uh, in women's hats uh, in the early part of the 20th century, and they were nearly uh, hunted to extinction, which is the rationale uh, for the statute. Uh, the statute implements uh, a series of treaties or conventions between the United States and four countries, uh, Canada, Mexico, Japan, uh, and Russia. And as I said, it currently uh, protects a little over uh, a thousand birds, but only birds that are native to the United States or to, uh, to the United States. Uh, if a bird has been uh, intentionally or unintentionally introduced by humans, uh, it's not protected uh, by this statute. Um, the prohibited activities are to uh, take, possess, import, export, uh, transport, sell, purchase, et cetera, et cetera, the bird or, or bird parts or eggs. Unfortunately, the statute has no definition of take, uh, and that raises a problem in the context of enforcement. Uh, this is a criminal statute. This, the section uh, that's cited there is, it's actually 16 USC section uh, 707 is the enforcement provision uh, in, in the Bird Act. Um, and there are criminal penalties uh, and imprisonment involved. It is a, a preferred statute in some respects by the U.S. government because at least for misdemeanors, it requires only strict liability. There's no new need to prove knowledge. There are felony provisions uh, for knowing takes, uh, and the criminal provisions are, are significant. Uh, $15,000 and six months in prison uh, for um, at least arguably an unintentional take for a misdemeanor, um, and then uh, forfeiture of equipment on, uh, upon conviction uh, as well. Felonies typically apply to commercial use or commercialization, so they're typically not, uh, in, typically not involved uh, with energy projects. And although injunctive relief isn't expressly provided for in the Act, some of the cases suggest that it might be available. Now, as I mentioned, there's no definition of take uh, in the statute. So it's a bit, although the slide says strict liability misdemeanor for incidental takes, that's really the government's position. Uh, the, case law, the case law on this issue is split. The government argues that incidental takes are a misdemeanor and it is strict liability. So you do not have to know that you, you just have to know that you uh, have uh, undertaken the act that you've taken a bird. You don't have to know. Uh, you don't have to do it intentionally. And the second and tenth circuits agree with that approach. They hold that because it is a misdemeanor provision in the statute, even accidental takes or incidental takes, 
takes that are associated with otherwise lawful activity uh, are in fact misdemeanors. Uh, the Fifth, Eighth, and Ninth Circuits uh, at least uh, hold that accidentally killing birds did not give rise to criminal liability uh, under the statute. So in one recent Fifth Circuit case, uh, the Fifth Circuit reversed a conviction uh, under the Bird Act for accidental, an accidental kill of migratory birds that were, uh, that were killed when they flew into uncovered oil tanks. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, we'll spend a, a more time on it when we talk about uh, the wind hypothetical in, in just a moment, uh, but that's the, it, it, it relates to enforcement, which is why it is here uh, on this next slide, and that's the 2012 uh, land-based wind energy guidelines uh, that were promulgated uh, by the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they are best management practices. They do not uh, prevent enforcement actions. It is not a safe harbor, but they are relevant uh, in the question of prosecutor prosecutorial discretion as to whether Fish and Wildlife would bring an action under the Bird Act or, for that matter, under the Eagle Act. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, again, more in more detail uh, with respect to the guidelines in a few moments, but. It is a five-tier process. A couple of those steps are pre, actually three steps are pre-construction, two steps are post-construction. The idea is to develop information with respect to possible mitigation uh, and then test that information and that mitigation in post-construction uh, in, in post-construction studies. These guidelines are voluntary, but they really, since 2012, have really established essentially an informal rule book by which uh, Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service judges the appropriateness of mitigation uh, at a particular site and, uh, and considers it for uh, potential enforcement. All right, well, uh, next to the uh, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, uh, a couple of things with respect to bald, uh, bald and Golden Eagles. Bald eagles were removed uh, from the federal list of threatened and endangered species uh, in 2007, so they're no longer protected under the ESA. Uh, however, bald and golden eagles are two of the birds that are listed as that uh, that are listed under the Bird Act, under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So they are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. In addition to that, there is a specific bald and golden eagle protection act, which prohibits uh, anyone from taking bald eagles without a permit. Um, and this statute actually defines uh, the term take, which is uh, help, more helpful than the bird statute or than the bird act, uh, and it defines it to include, among other things, disturbance of bald eagles to the extent they are substantially, to the extent you substantially interfere with breeding, feeding, or their sheltering behavior. So it's not just killing the birds. It's not just wounding or capturing them or trapping them or molesting them, which are the other terms used in the statute. Uh, it is interfering with them. And that, by the way, includes removal of nests and removal of habitat, uh, at least with respect to nests, unless those nests have been inactive, uh, which, the, uh, which the regulations suggest are um, not occupied by either adults, dependent young, or eggs uh, for, at least, uh, for at least 10 consecutive days. Now, there are uh, permits for taking uh, eagles that are available under the Eagle Act, uh, essentially for uh, what we would call an incidental take under the ESA. It's called a non-purposeful non -purposeful take uh, under the Eagle Act. Um, and it is, a, it is a take that is uh, not intentional, but it, again, is incidental to otherwise lawful conduct. Um, there's also uh, what's known as a programmatic take, and that actually is more applicable to uh, wind projects. A programmatic take is a permit that um, is for uh, an incidental take of eagles that may reoccur. So it is most germane uh, to wind farms. Uh, in 2013, typically um, before, in 2009, when the programmatic take um, uh, permits uh, came into effect uh, under Fish and Wildlife Services program under the Eagle Act, the, permit, the, pro, the programmatic take permits had a five-year duration. Uh, in 2013, Fish and Wildlife thought, said, that's too short. We're going to extend that programmatic take permit duration to 30 years because wind farms are in place for a long time. We're going to have a five-year look back. 
in each case, but we're going to extend it to 30 years. Um, that uh, regulation was uh, invalidated in 2015 by a district court that said that Fish and Wildlife did not under, didn't um, undertake environmental review in support of that rule. Um, so we are now back to five-year programmatic take permits under the EGLE Act, although the Fish and Wildlife Service has repromulgated a draft of the 30-year rule and they are, they are conducting an EIS on that rule as well. Uh, so that is, that is, going, that is going forward. Um, understand the, one of the key, one of the important things to understand about the EGLE Act is that the, uh, any ongoing or programmatic take has to be unavoidable even after implementation of advanced conservation practices. So you've got to do advanced cons uh, con uh, conservation practices first for eagles before even looking to a programmatic take permit. Um, enforcement uh, under the Eagle Act, again, this too is a, is a uh, criminal statute, um, and you see the penalties there, although it is the, the criminal statute is for uh, knowing, knowingly taking with wanton disregard. Uh, so it's a much, a much different standard, a much stiffer standard, much more difficult standard to prove for the government uh, uh, than the Bird Act. There's also uh, an equipment failure provision and there are civil penalties of up to $12,000 per take uh, under the Eagle Act. Um, finally, uh, with, respect to this, with respect to this statute, um, the, the 2012 land-based uh, wind energy guidelines um, are, are applicable here, uh, just as they're applicable uh, under the in, endangered and relevant under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and under the Bird Act, but in addition uh, to those uh, land-based wind energy guidelines, uh, Fish and Wildlife promulgated an Eagle Conservation Plan guidance in 2013. Uh, it is specific to eagles. It is necessary. It, it is it is voluntary. But if you are looking to develop, to develop an Eagle Conservation pro, uh, Plan uh, and ultimately get a programmatic take permit you've got to prepare a conservation, an eagle conservation plan, and you've got to follow the guidelines, or you've got to follow the guidance uh, that uh, Fish and Wildlife has set out um, for, that, for, that particular, uh, for that particular permit. Um, it, it, is, it is similar in some respects uh, to, uh, and complementary uh, to the 2012 land-based wind energy guidelines, which are are deal with all avian uh, and, and bat species, but again, this is this deals uh, particular uh, is particularly uh, focused on uh, on eagles. And again, more on that in a couple of minutes when we talk a little bit about the hypothetical. Um, voluntary again, this this these are volun this is a voluntary guidance as well, and doesn't prevent uh, any enforcement action. And so that's what we've got. That concludes our discussion of both the Bird Act and the Eagle Act. And Jim is now going to touch briefly on a couple of other relevant laws. Right. This is very brief because I want to get to the hypotheticals. It's more of a reminder that, that we haven't listed all the acts that are out there. Uh, to the extent you have a project that involves marine mammals, there is a Marine Mammal Protection Act, which has its own separate process for incidental take permits. Uh, inc incidentally, um, if you get a permit under the MMPA, you have to have to get a Section 7 consultation and potentially a, uh, an incidental take uh, uh, authorization under the Endangered Species Act, too. So it doesn't get you out of the Endangered Species Act if you have an endangered marine mammal. So it's, it's a different act, but they overlap. Um, we mentioned the NEPA a number of times already. Really only relevant if you have some kind of federal uh, uh, authorization or link or something. Um, again, you don't get a, a NEPA requirement for Section 7 consultations, but if you have a permit or something else that's federally related, you're back in the world of NEPA again, which, as folks know, takes some time and expense. Um, don't forget that for many of these federal laws, states have uh, analogs to these. Many states have many NEPAs that aren't just tied to state uh, authorization, but sometimes private act action, like in California. Um, states have wetlands laws, and states have Endangered Species Act laws, or uh, sometimes just mentioning birds of cons conservation concern, sometimes they have acts that, that parallel or even go stricter than the Endangered Species Act. You could have a species listed under state law that's not listed under federal law. Uh, and the last piece here is uh, uh, on top of these environmental statutes, states also have uh, setting and permitting authority, uh, which often incorporate the federal protections. So if you're getting a PCA, PSC license, PUC certificate, 
for your project, you might find that under a matter of state law, you have to meet all these federal requirements too. And if you violate the federal law, not only are you liable under federal law, but you may violate your certificate and put your project up at risk as well. Um, but why don't we spend the time now, since uh, we're, we've been taking some time up, going to the hypotheticals, and we'll move back to that on his wind project. Okay, well, thanks, Jim. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, a, a hypothetical uh, new wind farm, uh, and we're going to assume that it is going to be built somewhere in the Midwest. And we've got a number of animal and plant species, uh, at least in the area of that uh, project, that are uh, either threatened, endangered, or candidate species under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and let's assume that we've got uh, our friend the northern long-eared bat, uh, which Jim mentioned earlier, and the whooping crane uh, involved. Now, I, I raise those two because they are, they are um, relatively common uh, in, in the Midwest, and they're issues that we've seen for other clients in, in wind farms before. Uh, and the, one of the important things to consider with respect to both of those species is that it, the, the function of mitigation is really going to depend upon, uh, in, in many cases, uh, and actually in both cases, the proximity um, of, the, of, of certain areas where, as Jim, as Jim mentioned, white nose syndrome is in place for the long-eared bat, um, or uh, the proximity my, to migration routes uh, for whooping cranes. Uh, for the long-eared bat, as Jim mentioned, uh, just in January of 2016, it was listed as threatened, but only in areas where white, nis white nose syndrome is, is, uh, has been found or has been confirmed, which is a deadly bat disease. It's been confirmed in 26 states and five Canadian provinces. So Fish and Wildlife used its flexibility under Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act to allow all incidental takes of the bats in areas that weren't affected by the syndrome. So it's an interesting approach that, that Fish and Wildlife took in this case. What they were looking at are the areas, the, the bat is listed as threatened, but only in areas where white nose syndrome has been found because it's really white nose syndrome that threatens the bat as opposed to, as opposed to incidental takes. So, you need to deal with that issue in, in a wind farm in the context of mitigation for a wind farm if you, uh, if you have the bat, if you're in the white nose area syndrome for that bat. If you're not, you don't need to worry about it. It's not, uh, it's not a threatened species. Uh, whooping cranes, and I'm going to hop to just the next slide here. I'll hop back in a minute. But um, whooping cranes are interesting because, again, as Jim mentioned, there are only roughly 350 of the animals left. And they have a significant migration pattern, which is you can see here um, from uh, from Canada to uh, to Texas. Uh, and so, really, the question of what you what you need to do with the whooping crane is going to be based upon how close you are uh, to the migration route. Projects that are outside of the 90th uh, percentile corridor for whooping cranes, that is, 90% of the migration sightings. Uh, are, are in that corridor. If you're outside of that corridor, which is a couple of hundred miles wide, but if you're outside of that corridor, you're unlikely to re, uh, require significant mitigation. But if you're inside 90th percentile or even closer, um, you're going to require mitigation, there's no question. And, and what does that mean? It could mean stopping operations uh, while the, if you see a crane or if uh, during certain uh, times of the year when cranes are likely to be migrating, you could have to, to alter specific turbine speeds uh, on, on, the, on your wind turbines to ensure that you don't, ad, you don't adversely, that you don't, you don't uh, take any of the whooping cranes. Um, interestingly enough, you may, you may even have to change the lighting uh, on your actual wind turbines. Um, the, the standard FAA, Federal Aviation Administration lighting is not appropriate in an area which is near uh, any whooping crane migration corridors because those red those red lights on the top of the of the stanchions uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the wind turbines will actually draw the cranes to them. Uh, so you need to put strobe lights on those on those uh, wind turbines as opposed um, uh, as opposed to, to uh, standard red lights. Um, here, let's also assume in the hypothetical that you have other migratory birds uh, 
uh, including bald and golden eagles uh, that are documented in the project area. So, so what are your issues? Well, first, for, for ESA purposes, um, the question is, as Jim talked about before, is there a federal permit or approval required? Is there a federal nexus? If there is a federal nexus, you are in the meat grinder of Section 7 consultation that's likely to come into play and go back to the slides that Jim talked about, slides 5 and 6, uh, to um, potentially, uh, to likely require a permit to, to require some sort of an incidental take authorization in that context. Um, even if there's no federal nexus, if there is an incidental take under the ESA, the facility may, may need to go through the process that Jim described under Section 10. And again, back to uh, back to, to uh, slide six or so uh, in, the, in the slide deck in the presentation. As Jim pointed out, this is going to require a habitat conservation plan. And a habitat conservation plan, in order to get uh, a, a, a permit under uh, Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act, and a habitat conservation plan is going to require mitigation. As Jim mentioned, there is a Midwest, there's a draft Midwest multi-species habitat conservation plan that's sort of that's in development uh, by the Fish and Wildlife Service. It covers seven states um, in, in the Midwest, um, but it is still in draft. The public comment on that program or on that uh, draft closed uh, this summer. Um, it, it's, it's some time away from being, first thing is it's some time away from being final. And the second is it doesn't, it doesn't, it covers some important species, some listed bats, six or so listed bat and bird species and one bat species that may be listed in the future, and the bald eagle. But, for example, it doesn't cover the whooping crane. So even if that uh, habitat conservation plan ultimately comes into play, it doesn't mean that you can rely on it uh, exclusively. You might, have to, you might have to modify that habitat conservation plan as well. So even without a federal nexus, the point of departure, I think, for the dealing with the Endangered Species Act, the Bird Act, and the Eagle Act um, uh, in wind farms is the, what we referenced before, the 2012 land-based wind energy guidelines. Uh, and if there are gold, gold and bald, and bald eagles and golden eagles in the area, as there are here, the 2013 uh, Eagle Conservation Plan. And that's set up just briefly without going into a lot of detail. It's set up in a series of tiers. Uh, fundamentally, the first steps in both cases, the first steps are a preliminary site evaluation. So you're looking, that these, these guidance documents are helping a developer not just determine mitigation, but in the first instance, determine where a, a site might possibly be located to avoid highly sensitive areas and determine and, and avoid um, this particular species of concern if possible. Uh, so you're looking at a preliminary site evaluation, site characterization, and then probably the most important pre uh, construction step under the guidelines is studies to document what the wildlife and habitat and predict potential impacts. In this point, you're looking to predict how many likely takes that you will have, what your impact will be, what are the, signif what are the significant adverse impacts, and how might they be mitigated. There are two post-construction steps, and they tend to be looked at, they tend to be, to be, to be studies that um, evaluate the, uh, the efficacy of mitigation, how many birds have actually, what, what the fatality risk is, whether the predictions that you made pre-construction are coming to the fore, and if they're not, if you're killing more birds than you predicted uh, in pre-construction studies, you may have to do additional post-construction studies to look at why, your, uh, why, the mitig why mitigation uh, is not effective. Uh, so, and the, the Eagle Act is, is similar, but specific to eagles. There are slightly, there are five stages of the Eagle Act. Again, it's largely pre-construction, post-construction, but in both cases, you've got to identify what is out there, uh, identify, make a prediction as to what the impact is likely to be um, with respect to uh, mortality, uh, and then confirm that impact uh, post construction um, with uh, with additional with additional studies, um, as I said before, these guidance these guidances both of these guidance documents uh, are not necessarily safe harbors. Um, if you do not if you opt for, if you if you opt not to go for a permit, uh, 
under the Endangered Species Act uh, or the uh, or the Bald and Golden Eagle Act, um, but they do uh, they they are relevant to Fish and Wildlife's uh, decision to exercise prosecutorial discretion uh, if there is a take. Um, Jim, you want to uh, discuss uh, the um, natural gas hypothetical? Yeah, I'll be uh, I'll be a little quick on this one too, so we get to the conclusions and any questions. But uh, you know, we've been focusing on on wind uh, uh, because that's obviously a lot of impacts you can have on birds as well as uh, protected bats. Um, if you're not slicing and dicing those creatures or frying them with solar arrays, which also happens, we haven't gone to that that at all. But uh, if you just have a regular uh, energy project, and I picked a gas plant because that's what people are building these days more than others. Um, you have some different additive issues. Well, one thing you have, you don't have the same kind of guidance you're seeing in the wind uh, program because uh, if there's less of a specific danger. Most of it comes from how you, where you develop your plant. Um, so siting, so most of these, these, are, uh, these are issues of spotting. Uh, where you site your project is obviously very important. If you have a greenfield project, you're going to involve some portion of land uh, clearance. That's going to be an issue. Versus a brownfield, a, you know, reconversion of a facility, you might not have any issues at all because you're an industrial site without any species nearby. Um, if you have a federal permit, you remember you're back in the Section 7 world for consultations, and most of these uh, energy projects, particularly CCNG projects, will involve at least a, Cal a clean air permit, a PSD permit, or an NSR permit. You'll get a wetlands permit if you're crossing any wetlands, if you're putting any water out, um, uh, any wastewater, you have a, a NIPTES permit. And if you're actually bringing water into a cooling pond, you need a, 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 a NIPTES intake permit. All of those um, have species implications to them, and particularly uh, the way the rule is written right now on the uh, Rule 316B rule of the Clean Water Act, uh, which is, by, by the way, of the challenge right now being briefed, there is a requirement that the Fish and Wildlife Service actually look at your, your, your permit before you get it. So it's not just a consultation. The Fish and Wildlife Service is looking at it because this has to do with entrapment and entrainment of species uh, through the water. It's a, mostly a marine issue. Um, for gas plants and maybe other plants are very specific issues to consider. Um, again, you're, if you're clearing land, you've got to worry about your habitat. So maybe you're not so worried about, you know, knocking a species out of the air with a turbine, but the fact that you're plowing through trees and, um, and, and, and areas that might be critical habitat for species still puts you in the take world and the Section 7 world or the incidental take permit world. So the fact that you're modifying riparian areas or heavy tree areas, we'll get to in a second, on these linear uh, uh, facilities, you actually have to worry about the impact on this critical habitat which is defined for each of the species that are, that are listed and um, puts you into the world of, uh, of, uh, of take reviews. Um, certain features of natural gas plants and other plants will get you into endangered species issues, particularly transmission lines associated with those plants. That also has to do with wind plants and solar plants as well. If you're putting in linear plant, linear lines, you've got issues. I'll talk about in a second. In natural gas plants, you're going to have natural gas pipelines. You're putting big pipelines in from some far distance. That will involve uh, land clearing issues and uh, forest fragmentation issues. Um, talked about cooling water, you're going to have either ponds or wells that are either going to have to be dug or uh, maintained, and especially if you have ponds, you've got particular issues with fish and wildlife using the ponds. And you also have thermal discharges. In Florida, you have plants that have been uh, sus basically sustaining manatee populations for 50 years because of warm water. If those plants change or alter their thermal discharges, you could actually harm the habitat and harm manatees. Uh, finally, um, you're storing your natural gas somewhere, um, that actually is, is issues as well because it's more land clearing. Uh, there are probably other ones out there, uh, but I wanted to alert you the fact that if you've got a, uh, any other kind of energy facility, you have issues to consider as well. Um, you may not be using a turbine, but your critical habitat uh, and also potential harm to species through other project, parts of your project uh, are quite likely. We move over to the, uh, the last slide in this hypothetical area. Uh, I mentioned uh, transmission and uh, uh, move over one more, uh, Thad. I mentioned, um, can you move the slide, one more slide over? Oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> I love you. Uh, transmission and pipeline do have special considerations. These are linear um, features that could go for, you know, a quarter mile or, or 50 miles or more. And the concern here is habitat fragmentation. It's really a bird act issue. It's not an endangered species act as much because if you're upsetting critical habitat, you're already in problems. But if you're basically cutting forest up because you're putting in transmission lines or pipelines, the Fish and Wildlife Service wants to talk to you. Um, there is an executive order out uh, during the uh, 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 2011 or 10 or so uh, that basically said the agencies had to pay attention to uh, harming birds. And uh, because of that, FERC, which licenses um, some transmission lines and pipelines, um, has, has an agreement with the Fish, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, 
essentially uh, to make sure that uh, when they grant their licenses, they are not leading to fra habitat fragmentation, which could harm birds, migratory birds, or even birds specific concern. It doesn't have to be endangered species. Uh, the, what's, what's important about this is under these MOUs with the agencies, the agencies like FERC might require you to come up with measures and plans to mitigate and compensate harm uh, created to these uh, corridors you're, you're, you're building and putting terms and conditions and certificates. So even outside the uh, Bird and Endangered Species Act world, just like I mentioned in the uh, PUC certificates, you might find yourself with a FERC certificate putting in additional provisions because you're uh, fragmenting habitat. And this is a particular concern because it requires compensation. Uh, most of these agreements require some payment of a fair amount of money uh, to buy more property, you give it to an environmental organization that protects. Um, and here the Fish and Wildlife Service goes beyond the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and actually identifies birds of conservation and fragmentation concern. So when you get a, uh, a study done, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, for your project, and you're looking beyond the uh, migratory birds, you're probably also looking at fragmentation issues and, and harm to potential birds of con uh, conservation concern and ask to put some money up. Another uh, guideline that, uh, that's relevant to you putting up projects with transmission, there is an avian protection plan guidelines by the Avian Powerline Interaction Commission. This, like the uh, wind guidelines, is a Fish and Wildlife Service blessed, um, jointly developed program where you put in certain controls to protect uh, harm uh, to birds from your transmission facilities. And if you do these features, uh, you reduce the impacts on the birds and you reduce your potential liability because there is some concept of uh, discretionary, uh, discretionary enforcement if you're doing the right thing. The last thing I mentioned in the slide is if you have to pay compensation uh, and mitigation for your projects, the Fish and Wildlife Service has a brand new pro uh, uh, policy proposed on compensatory mitigation, which goes beyond just project by project and looks to landscape style mitigation creating all sorts of alternative ways for them to ask you to pay for the project you're doing. With that, and, um, let's bring and, to the conclusion. And yeah, and yep. Jim, just, just quickly before we leave the slide, one, the one point I want to make is the, the Avian Protection Plan guidelines um, are trans, transmission line specific. And in fact, the 2012 land-based wind energy guidelines say don't do an Avian Protection Plan for wind plants or for, for wind facilities do a bird and bat conservation strategy under the land-based wind energy guidelines. So just, just don't want any confusion there. They're, they are different. They are similar in some respects, but Fish and Wildlife Service has opted for one for transmission facilities and one for wind facilities. Right. Thank you. Go, go ahead. All right, okay. So just to conclude everything, um, so uh, we've given you lots of laws and lots of, uh, of, lots of concerns. There are certainly ways of working around this. The, as I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, the most important thing is to clearly identify the scope of your project, potential impacts at the very start. Let you, let you define the project before you let the federal government divide the project. Um, and you want to develop a strategy which uh, particularly avoids jeopardy, avoids impacts, avoids harm, and includes avoidance and minimization measures, essentially, so you can get yourself out of a lot of uh, problems. You should anticipate where the agency is going to have issues, both federal and state. You should anticipate the challenges you're going to find um, from the agencies, but also from the, share, from the stakeholders out there, the uh, folks who are concerned about the species in the, the non-governmental world. Identify that we have data gaps and essentially reach out before to the agencies and stakeholders ahead of time to kind of uh, minimize the problems you can have rather than move ahead with your project. Another important thing here is to hire experts where you need them. Um, experts are very important for things like desktop assessments of whether you have endangered species in the area, as well as field surveys. Uh, which will be necessary to determine in more detail during your consultations your, or your uh, habitat conservation plan or even your decision not to take a plan to prove there aren't any harms. You need somebody who actually knows about the birds and how they act in the wild. And there are a number of experts in the area who handle these things. And they will also help you evaluate and, and uh, develop avoidance and minimization measures. Um, I mentioned uh, reaching out to the agencies. You want to have early and continued communication with Fish and Wildlife and state agencies, both of them, and other agencies that might be relevant help you scope out issues because if you don't do it now, issues are going to come up later in the, in the process when you have less time to deal with it and they become projects of delay rather than uh, projects to work out at the beginning. You want to stay actively involved in the process from the very beginning. I mentioned scoping, but also about data gathering, the biological assessment, uh, the habitat conservation plan. You, know, you're, you're, you should be doing as much with your expert as possible um, to draft these documents. Uh, many agencies will want you to do that anyway because they don't have the resources. Other agencies will rather do it themselves, but when they don't, you'll have to be kind of lobbying them on uh, making sure your voice is heard. And um, you should uh, 
You should also continue to monitor um, the Fish and Wildlife Service activities. They're always listing new species. They're coming up with these regional plans. And you also should monitor what the community is doing in terms of concerns on certain species. Uh, the most important part in all of this uh, involvement is to continue to build an administrative record uh, because you might have to defend your project either to the Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS or in court um, because a citizen has challenged you or there's a government enforcement action against you because you've taken a species. And in these situations, you're going to have, need to rely on a body of documentation that will include your analyses, your studies of impacts, all the work you've done in following your guidelines, and more importantly, uh, the work with the agencies to show the agencies have been uh, at least uh, uh, coordinating with you and maybe even acquiescing in your actions, which might take away the ability for them to bring an enforcement action. Which brings to the last point for, uh, Pat's going to talk about is what happens when you have this decision point of whether to go for a permit or not. When I mean by permit, we're talking about an incidental take permit. Uh, right, and, and, and this is a... <laughs> This is a, to, to permit or not to permit, that is the question, and that's the question we're, we're, we're going to end on. Um, as the slide says, and as, as Jim mentioned uh, earlier, if you are in a circumstance where you have uh, a federal nexus and you have a take, um, it's difficult under the Endangered Species Act to get out from under the permit. You may not even have to, ha you may not, uh, even have to ask this question, you may just have to get a permit uh, period, unless you can show that there are no effects, you no takes, no effects, no adverse effects uh, to species um, or to habitat. Um, if you are in a position where you're dealing with uh, Section 10, you don't have a federal, you don't have a federal nexus, and you're dealing with uh, Section 10 incidental take permits under the Endangered Species Act, then there may be a question. Uh, then the question arises as to whether to go forward with a permit or not. Permits, as Jim mentioned, are time consuming. Uh, they, they are very costly. They do give you, however, uh, clear liability protection. Um, if you do not have, if you decide opt, to, if you opt not to go for a permit uh, under the Endangered Species Act or the Bald and, and Golden Eagle Act, um, then they, 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 you do run the risk if you have a take uh, of an enforcement action. One way to attempt, if you forego that permit process, one way uh, to attempt uh, to cover yourself is to get an agency assurance. But often those uh, are, are difficult to get. Agency, the agency sometimes will not give them. Uh, and we've had cl clients that have gone through and, and prepared um, uh, bird and bat conservation strategies, submitted them to the agency and just never heard back from the agency again. And at that point, what, what do you do? I get, our best advice in that circumstance would be to follow the applicable guidance documents, the land-based uh, wind energy guidelines um, and the, and the, bald, or and the uh, eagle uh, conservation uh, protection guidelines, uh, conservation plan guidelines, as closely as possible. Um, it's not an absolute, uh, it, it's a way to minimize risk, it's not an absolute way uh, to prevent an enforcement action, but it's clear from the case law and it's clear actually from both of those guidance documents that Fish and Wildlife is going to consider uh, refraining from bringing enforcement actions if the guidance documents are followed, uh, are, are followed carefully. The difficulty is, uh, if Fish and, you may think that you followed the guidance document uh, in, 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 to the T, whereas fish and wildlife may disagree. And there have been some cases where that has ended up to be uh, the case after there were some takes, and fish and wildlife has enforced in those cases because they don't believe the guidance uh, was completely complied with. Uh, so it's, it's, it goes back to Jim's point about building an administrative record. You want to build an administrative record uh, here as well. And that's the last point on the slide. Um, it's not just the initial mitigation plan, it's also regular, to, regular monitoring of operations so you can establish that the mitigation is, ha, is in fact effective or has in fact been effective. Jim, anything you want to add to that? No, I think we talked enough. Um, yeah, I would clearly have no time for questions, but we're happy to hang on if, if people want to do that and ask questions. Right. Um, it, just a reminder, if you'd like CLE credit, uh, please return the sign-in sheet um, that we sent yesterday.
uh, and you'll also receive a survey just to give us a better idea of, or give us an idea of how we're doing and, and how we can improve and topics for future webcasts uh, and the like. And as Jim mentioned, we're happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, I don't think we had any questions come in uh, during the course of the program, but um, we're happy to answer them offline. You have our contact information on this final slide. Uh, you can also send them to Dorsey U, and we will uh, answer them for you by email. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, Jim, thanks much, and um, have a pleasant afternoon, everyone.